with me this morning. God, we just thank you for bringing each and every one of us to this place. And God, we thank you so much that our Redeemer does live. Amen. And God, that our Redeemer lives in each one of us, that our Redeemer lives in this place. And God, we ask that when we go out from this place, we let other people know that our Redeemer lives. Yes. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Will you tell somebody around you they're in the right place today? <laughs> Our scripture reading is from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 and 12. From James, a servant of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes of the Diaspora. Greetings. Think of it as pure joy, my family and God, whenever you face trials of any sort. You understand that your faith is put to the test only to make you patient, but patience too has its practical results. It's to make you fully mature and lacking in nothing. Blessed are those who persevere under trial. Once their worth has been proven, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to the faithful. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks be to God. All right, let me tell you this first of all. Um, at the end of the school semester, we always take a little vacation trip, first to celebrate the end of the school semester, and second to reward Kay for being patient and lasting through that nine months of suffering through my school semester with me. So we took a little trip to gay days at Disney. And wouldn't you know it, Disney World lets kids in. <laughs> and, and on a bus somewhere about the second day, some crumb snatcher passed me the crud. <laughs> Thank goodness it was an upper respiratory crud, so I'm still kind of <clears throat> so. If I get a little whoopty croopy and I have to take a drink, just pardon me. Um, because Pastor Keith let me know on Friday that he needed me to do this today, I've, go <laughs> I've gone back to using notes because I just couldn't cram it all in there in the time I had. But hey, you don't mind, right? Okay, so I've been with you guys about nine or ten months, and I figure it's time to give birth, right? I've been here. Look like I could give birth, I know. <laughs> but uh, I figure it's time for me to... Uh, to share a little bit of my story with you, because I don't know if you know it, but during this nine or ten months we've been together, you've been teaching me, I've been learning from you, but I've also been in communications with Pastor Keith almost every week. We've tried, you know his, his um, administrative and, and, and organizational <laughs> skills, or I love you, Keith, I do, but his organizational skills are really challenging. So we've tried to meet together on a weekly basis. All right, those who laugh loudest, you know. Um, we've tried to get together on a weekly basis and compare notes about what I think I'm learning and what I think I need to learn. And he's told me things that he thinks I need to learn and what have you. And uh, some of the questions that have bubbled up from you to him, he's been passing back to me. No names have been mentioned. But uh, one of the things that stuck with me from the very beginning was some one person or persons uh, mentioned to him, can she really be that happy all the time? <laughs> and that's kind of been like a ping pong ball in my brain since last August. And I've thought about it, thought about it. Uh, I thought, well, before I leave them, I'll share my testimony with them and, and let you understand that, no, I'm not that happy all the time, but I got joy down deep in my soul. And, and that's why you see the me you see. So uh, I put together this sermon some time ago. It's called Blue Jean Faith. You may have noticed my appearance today. I'm wearing my favorite pair of Levi blue jeans. They fit. They hold me in all the right places, and they make me feel really comfortable. I like them a lot. And I would bet that all of you have a pair of jeans that you feel the same way about because they fit. They feel good, right? Well... Let me tell you something about blue jeans. From the 17th century, denim has been used in so many ways 
but one of the most enduring and endearing ways that this amazing fabric has been used has been as blue jeans. In 1873, a young man named Levi Strauss left his home in New York and moved to San Francisco. He had an idea of opening up a dry goods store to take care of the needs of the people that were moving there for the gold rush. Well, it wasn't long after he arrived there and opened up that dry goods store that he discovered the things he brought from New York just weren't going to make it in that environment. The clothes he brought from New York weren't rugged enough. They didn't last. But he saw a business opportunity when he, he knew it, when he saw it. And so he sat down with his partner, a guy whose name we don't even remember. He thought about it, and he went out and he bought some denim, and they put together what would become a social icon, <laughs> Levi's. <laughs> Levi's, jeans that are worn by coal miners in West Virginia. They're worn by Hollywood starlets on Rodeo Boulevard. They're worn by rock and rollers. They're worn by people who play classical Mozart at fine pianos such as this, right? They're the twang of country music, you know? They're an American icon, Levi jeans, right? They're in, they endure. They stand the test of time. Well, that's my faith. It's blue jean faith. It stood the test of time. It wasn't easy. It took a long time to get to where I am today. And I'll just bet some of you have blue jean faith as well. And whether or not you know it, some of you are developing blue jean faith. And some of you may not have even started on that road yet. But trust me, it's going to be real comfortable to you one of these days. And you're going to be just fine. Trust me in that. Blue jeans have stood the test of time because they endure, they're practical, they're durable. And that's exactly what we need in our faith lives too. We need a faith that lasts, a faith that's practical and relevant to our lives, whatever our lives may be, whatever we find ourselves in. The book of James is one of my favorite books in the Bible because it's so practical. James doesn't cut any slack. He just tells it like it is. That's my kind of guy, James, the brother of Jesus. Talk about a tough road to follow. Can you imagine being J Jesus' brother? I mean, come on, why can't you be more like your brother? <laughs> Jeez, Mom, give me a break, right? How many times have you heard that? Think about James, poor James. Anyway, there's no get-out-of-jail-free card in life everybody's life is going to have struggles. Everybody's life is going to have trials and tribulations and times when you just want to quit. Everybody's life. Don't think you're special because you're not. Everybody's life is going to have those days. Some lucky few might get away with a few minor skirmishes. And others are going to have lives that seem like the mother of all wars. Sometimes I look at my life and I think, now where do I fit on that continuum, you know? And I look around and I think, boy, compared to your life, mine seems pretty easy. And then I look at other people and I think, boy, yeah, exactly, always. I know as a young fellow at Cornerstone MCC in Mobile who was born with cerebral palsy, and he's in a wheelchair, and Kevin is just full of joy. And when we have praise and worship services, I look over and I see Kevin with his little arms raised and he's just singing at the top of his voice. I can't understand a word he's saying. Kay has to interpret for me. But Kevin is full of joy and he's praising the Lord. And I think, shut up, Sarah. Kevin is joyful in his situation in life. You got nothing to complain about. Amen. You know, you got nothing to complain about. <clears throat> now, James tells us to count it all joy. Seriously? count it all joy there's sometimes I just don't feel like counting it all joy in fact there's sometimes I don't want to count any of it joy and there's sometimes I just want to tuck my tail between my legs and run as fast as I can for the door and that's what I want to tell you about today a time in my life when I did just that I ran away from a situation because I just wasn't prepared for it I thought I was I was 18 years old 
and I had a calling on my life to go into the mission field. I was raised in the Southern Baptist Church by my parents who were middle class people. They, they did the very best they could for me and my brother. They, um, I can't hold anything against them for the things they did. They thought they were being good parents, and they were good parents. Um, but anyway, I was going into uh, the mission field, and I was very excited about it. At 18 years old, the world was ahead of me, and I enrolled at William Carey College in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. It's a Baptist school, and I was going to be a medical missionary to the country of Yemen. Have you looked at Yemen today? <sighs> Sometimes I think. Maybe that was the right thing. But anyway, uh, I was at William Carey, and I was... Uh, studying and, and I was so excited about the future and, and how I was going to go out there and change the world for God. But also happened that, that freshman year of college that I met a young woman named Glenda and I fell in love for the first time in my life. Really head over heels in love for the first time in my life. Well as you can imagine the Southern Baptists weren't too pleased with that. And uh, and before the end of the first year of school, I was cordially invited to seek education elsewhere. They suggested across town at the University of Southern Mississippi where lifestyles like mine were less frowned upon. Okay, so I transferred across to Southern Mississippi. But uh, the Southern Baptist Convention Board also sent me a letter and said that your service is no longer needed in our foreign mission board. Now, the hardest thing for me to do was to go home and tell my parents, first, that I'd been kicked out of William Carey, and second, that their daughter, that they were so very proud of, would not be serving in the foreign mission board because they had bragged about it to all their church friends. <coughs> and the third thing was to tell them why those two first things had occurred. And I didn't think it would be such a big deal because my mother's younger brother whom she dearly loved, was gay. And my dad's sister that he was closest to was a lesbian. And I thought, well, this won't go so badly. They love Ed and my Aunt Boots. They love them dearly. And it's going to be OK. They'll understand. Well, they didn't. And uh, so after a little bit of wrangling back and forth with, you know, why is this so difficult for you? You love your brother and you love your sister. and if you wanted me to, I could name several others in your immediate family that are, that are also of this persuasion <laughs> that you may not be aware of. But uh, after that was all over and done with, they, uh, they kicked me out. So here I am, 19 years old now, and I have nowhere to go. No family, nowhere to go. The first time in my life I was on my own. And I know that probably is the same story of many of you who are sitting here today. What does a kid do who's always had their family to rely on and suddenly they have nothing? Well, I did what many of us do. I turned to drugs and alcohol. And for many years, I drowned myself in drugs and alcohol. And I chased that demon, trying to find a way to fill up that empty hole inside of me. And I hated it. Yeah, that's the right word. I hated God, and I hated church. And people like you, ugh, I hated you. I hated the very thought of you and anything that had to do with church. And this went on for 25 years. And I don't know what was wrong with God, why God just didn't go squish. I'm sick of you. God had a plan for me, obviously. God's much more patient than I ever desi deserved to be with me. Amen. But God had a plan. The 25 years of this drinking, drugging, suicidal thoughts, anything you can think of, I went through a series of really dangerous relationships. And the thing that, that brought me out of that was after a, one relationship that I stayed with for eight years with a particularly violent person, um, one morning I woke up and she was standing there with a gun to my head and I thought to myself, well, hmm, maybe I don't deserve to live. And 
you know, my life is so messed up, it would probably just be easier if I did die. But I think that was the mo one of the moments that I thought, hmm, there's got to be something else to life besides this drinking, drugging, and, and craziness that I'm doing right now. But I couldn't figure out what it was, and I surely wasn't going to go and ask God for any help. Because after all, look what God had done to me. God had, got, God had lost me everything I had ever. I was giving my life to God, and look what God allowed to happen to me, right? Well, it was right after that happened that God sent me my first angel, Kay. Kay came into my life, and Kay has a very strong faith. She was raised in the same, about the same family I was, a very strong faith-oriented family. And uh, she met me, and she helped with very, very gentle ways. She didn't ever push the religion thing with me, but she helped me to find my way out of the drugs and the alcohol and the crazy suicidal way I was living. <clears throat> and we, we, we started a relationship, and for 10 years, I must have been like living with a mean dog, though, because every time she mentioned church, even like, hey, it's Christmas. My family's part of the Christmas program at their church. Would you like to go? <laughs> yeah. I must have been like a mean dog. I know it was, just that's hateful. And I know she must have cried many times because I was just like, don't mention church to me, you know. But she, she was very gentle, and she'd back off, and she just let me have my space. But uh, after 10 years of living with me, I met my second angel, a young lady who was like 16, 17 years old, whose name was Christina, and she lived in DeRitter. You all know where DeRitter is. She was the daughter of one of my high school friends. And uh, Christina had an incurable form of bone cancer that affects teenagers. And Christina... Um, was in a wheelchair when I met her. She, her body was just completely ravaged by disease. But she absolutely glowed. Her faith was so strong. She would forego her mid-afternoon drugs for pain. And she would invite her friends over two or three at a time after school. And she would sit and talk to them after school and tell them about her faith. And tell them about how she believed in a better world and she believed in her future that she would be with God and that and that her life was not meaningless and that she wasn't angry because her life was going to end so soon at such a young age she shared her faith with her friends and you could tell from across the room there was something very special about that child's life and I remember thinking to myself here's a kid who has every reason to be angry and to hate God. And yet, she's filled with love. And she cares enough about the people around her that she wants to leave something with them, knowing that she's going to be gone very soon. Those two angels helped lead me back to Jesus. They helped lead me back to the church. It wasn't long after I met Christina. <coughs> it wasn't long after I met Christina that... I know, Kate, it's a wonder she didn't have a stroke and fall out. I woke up one Sunday morning and I said, Hey, Kate, how about we go try out that Cornerstone MCC down, you know, in Mobile? <laughs> and it is a wonder she didn't just die on me right then, you know. <laughs> like, where's the pod? Because I know you're not the Sarah I've been living with all these years. <laughs> but we did try it, and it was, it was frightening at first for me to go in there because I, I don't know what I expected. Maybe the bolt of lightning. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe for the walls do, to fall in. But um, it took me a long time of going there, and I sat in those services for weeks. I, I was a puddle of tears, and I've seen some people come here, and I see myself in them. They sit quietly, and they're, they're just weeping the entire service, and I know what they're going through. It's that transformation. It's that, it's that letting go of all that shame and... And, and feeling that love, and, and am I really worthy? And, and it's a big step, and we need to give them that space to feel those feelings and the, to let that experience happen, and, and we need to love them through it. And give them that space and let them feel that because it, it, it hurts, but it's a, it's a bittersweet kind of pain. 
And once they come out on the other side of it, they feel that love and it's good and it's wonderful. And then they're wounded healers that are willing to help someone else. But that's the journey I went through. And uh, so here I am, 37 years after that initial calling to a life of ministry. 37, um, most of them wasted years. So what, I'm, what I want to tell you this morning is that it's never too late. God, if you'll just turn around, you will find out that God has always been standing there. It doesn't matter how far you've fallen, how far you've run away. It doesn't matter how many thunder and lightning raging storms you've stood out in the middle of and raised your fist and cursed God. It doesn't matter. God likes a good fight. I'm a testimony to that. <laughs> I think God likes a good fight because for a few minutes at least we give up on complaining about stuff. <laughs> God's like, well, finally, something different, you know. <laughs> so keep that in mind, though. God is always ready for you to come back home. Like the prodigal child, God is always ready to open, open arms and welcome you back. But in closing, I want to share with you four characteristics of my blue jean faith, all right? First, blue jean faith is remarkable. It's strong and durable. Blue jeans are made of denim, and the reason it's so tough is because the way it's woven together is on a diagonal. It's not like a hatchwork like this, like a basket weave. It's woven diagonally, and that makes it incredibly strong. So all the trials and tribulations of my life and of your life it's sort of like that diagonally woven denim fabric. God uses those things to make you incredibly strong so that your faith will stand strong. When, when the storm's raging about you, you can count on your faith to get you through it. Because trust me, you're going to have trials. You're going to have hard times in your life. Nobody promised you a rose garden. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Oh, Rick is awake. All right, second, <laughs> blue jean faith takes on a different look over time. There's a special kind of dye called indigo blue that they use to dye blue jeans. And now before the days of designer jeans, when you could buy them already faded, or you could buy them already with a distressed look, you got those old blue jeans, right? And they, they came, they were certain color blue. And after you washed them 1,450 times, they got this nice color to them, right? Well, that's the same thing with our Christian lives. When we first come to get on a spiritual path, we're a certain color. But after we've walked that path a while, we start to fade away our old selves. And we start to take on the light of Christ so that we become more Christ-like and less self-like. So think of yourself as a faded pair of jeans when you start to see Christ shining through instead of that old indigo blue color shining through, you know you're becoming more like Christ. Third, blue jean faith becomes more comfortable as you wear it. Yep, yes it does. Like a new pair of jeans, sometimes you put them on and they're kind of stiff and they rub you in the wrong areas. And Especially if you get them wet and you sit around in them for a while. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? you ever been skinny dipping and put your jeans back on? You know what I'm talking about. They're not real comfortable, right? They, they'll chafe you in places. Well, when you first put on a life of faith, believe me, Christ is going to chafe you in a few places where your rough edges are. But don't worry about it. That's a good thing because that's just the places where you're being polished off so that you will fit more smoothly into your new faith walk. And the fourth thing is, Blue jean faith becomes a part of your very identity. When it becomes just a natural thing, when life around you is just falling all to hell and back, when you can walk right out in the middle of it and say, it's going to be okay, because I got faith, my God can deliver. Amen. I'm not worried about it. I'm going to beat this. Whatever it is, God's going to see me through it then you know you got blue jean faith, baby. Each one of us is called in our lives. Each one of us is called in our lives to live a life of service to God. Some way, somehow. 
But don't ever think that that's going to be a life of ease because Jesus told us, Mama said there's going to be days like this. Amen. Jesus said there's going to be days like this. Trust me on that. Jesus warned us about it. But he also told us to have faith in God to get us through them. And blue jean faith is the kind of faith we need to get through those days. It's durable. It's practical. It's strong. God will carry you through if you hold on to that kind of faith. God knows when you're afraid. God knows when you're at your weakest point. Yes, indeed. But God will give you something to cling to when you're fearful. God will give you the strength when you're your weakest. No matter what happens to you in your life, never doubt. God loves you fiercely above all things. God loves you. No matter how low you fall or how far you run, never doubt that God's able to deliver you. In painful times and when the trials and challenges are being woven into the fabric of your lives, turning to Jesus is the answer. He's the master artist who can skillfully weave the fibers of your life into a beautiful tapestry or into a very comfortable pair of jeans. Sometimes this may require standing in the middle of your trials long enough to know that God is enough. And sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes that is hard to do. We have to face the losses of our yesterdays. I face the loss of my family. I face the loss of never being a medical missionary in Yemen. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I face many losses, as, as many of you have. You have losses that you're still grieving. Sometimes we just have to grieve for those things and let them go. They're in the past, and they're not coming back. Let them go. Let God have them. Mark them off. Start new. Sometimes we have to face the reality of our today. Today, my brother's having to drive to Homa every day, Monday through Friday. Some days it's not easy to do. That's what you got to do today to make it, right? Got to do it. I understand that. Sometimes we have to face the unknowns of our tomorrows. Those of us who don't have jobs today. Those of us who are still recovering from surgery. And Larry, who's still at home, recovering from his illness. We have to face that unknown. Knowing, though, that God's with us. Amen. There will be a better tomorrow. There will be. <coughs> the thing is, we have to speak our doubts. Our doubts about what we're going through today and what we may have to face tomorrow, even if it means arguing with God. Because God, like I said, is not afraid of a good fight. God enjoys a good fight every now and then, I think. Our little spiritual battles. Um, maybe when the battle's over, we can see who God really is and see how big God really is. That changes our perspective a little bit. Hard times are never easy but they are opportunities for us to develop blue jean faith. and We may encounter a surprising God at the end. That's why I'm so joyful. That's why I'm so happy. So now you know a little bit more about me. That's something I've been trying to work on through my seminary years is being willing to share a little bit and be vulnerable with people. So uh, now you know me. So <clears throat> I encourage all of you to... Uh, Take some time to look back on your faith walk and look at the times when you struggled. Look at the times when God was weaving your faith together and be grateful for those times. But more importantly, look at the times now and the times and in the future and be willing to say, my faith is strong enough because my God is big enough. Amen. 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 several things from that sermon. One was Sarah's age, but I'm not going to share. <laughs> I'm going to wait a couple of weeks and see if the presents come my way, and then I'll, you know, then, then we'll do that. But, you know, but, but speaking of presents, that, you know, one of the things that you do realize along the, the, the journey is that it's not that easy. 
you know, the journey in a relationship, whether it's with your family, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's with whatever, there are bumps and rocks and all sorts of things in that road. I mean, today is Father's Day, and it reminded me that we've both lost our biological fathers. But, you know, one of the things that we've shared through all that was our faith, you know, and was our relationship with one another. And you know, we... We, we're not without our problems, as you could hear Rick laugh about that nobody promised you a rose garden thing, but you know. His beating is coming later, I pro no, not really. You know, but, the, the, you know, but it's true, I mean, you know, in a relationship, you have problems. But, but the thing that I realized about all of those things, all those losses, all those problems, was that the one thing we generally agree on is church, and how important this church is. We can argue about lots of things. We can disagree about lots of things in our relationship. But it's pretty rare that we don't come to some agreement about why church is important. Amen. Even if we don't agree about what needs to be done right now, Amen. we still know that what the reason we're saying that is because this church is important. It's important to us personally. It's important to everybody here. It's important to people who don't even know it's here yet. You know, And that's why you know one of the things we never disagree about is writing those tithes checks every month, or actually in this case, telling the computer to do it. But anyway, that, you, know, you know what I mean. Uh, you know, that, that, that's one thing that we never have an, an issue with because it's important to support this and it's important to support this church's work in the community and around the world. So will you pray with me now? God, we ask that you just bless this offering, bless each and every person who gives it. God, Help us to give freely. Help us to understand why it's important to support the work of MCC in our community and around the world through what we give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved. Anchored in Jehovah, I shall not be moved just like a tree. Planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. In His love abiding, I shall not be moved. And in Him confiding, I shall not be moved Just like a tree planted by the waters I shall not be moved I shall not be, I shall not be moved I shall not be, I shall not be moved Just like a tree planted by the waters I shall not be Though the tempest rages, I shall not be moved On the rock of ages, I shall not be moved Just like a tree planted by the waters I shall not be moved I shall not be, I shall not be moved I shall not be, I shall not be moved Just like a tree planted by the waters I shall not be moved I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water, I will not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water. We've come to the point in our service where we can come and enjoy the table that has been set for us. So, I will tell you what I know about this, what was passed down through the generations from the time of Jesus, how on the night that he was to be betrayed, he gathered in a room with his closest friends. After the meal was over, he took the leftover bread, which I think is significant. Leftovers, sort of like we are sometimes by society the leftover people. We can celebrate being that together this morning. He took the leftover bread and he broke it and he blessed it and he passed it to everyone there and he said, take and eat this. This is the bread of life, of the new covenant. My life I'm giving for you. 
And he also took the cup and he blessed it and he passed it to them and said, take and drink from this. This is the cup of joy, the cup of salvation of my life that I'm offering for each of you today. Down through the centuries, people have gathered and they've continued to celebrate that significant event, the offering of the bread of life and the cup of joy, the cup of salvation, the gift that was given freely for each of us and for those who will come after us. Will you join me as we bless these elements this morning? Wonderful God, we thank you so much for the gift that you gave us so freely on that night so long ago. We thank you for your faith that we would remember as you instructed us to do. We thank you for bringing us here this morning to remember you. We thank you, Lord, for the father figures in our lives who have taught us how to be people of faith. We thank you, Lord, for reminding us to be people of faith that will teach those who come after us. We ask, Lord, that you would feed us at your table this morning. Teach us to live lives that are worthy of your followers. These things we ask in your precious and holy name. Amen. At MCC Baton Rouge and at MCCs across the world today, we offer an open communion table. You do not have to be a member of this church or of any church at all to come and partake of this feast because this is God's table and it's offered freely to you. We will have servers on either side that will serve you. They will take the wafer and dip it in the unfermented grape juice and place it on your tongue. Or if you prefer to serve yourself, simply cup your hands and we'll place the wafer in your hands. We'll also have prayer partners on either side. If you have a special prayer concern, please use our prayer partners. There are people of faith that are willing to share their gift with you this morning and hear your special needs and be intercessors for you today. Please come as the ushers direct with the acolytes. Please come and join us. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. Give myself away so you can come on, let him know. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. What would happen if a generation embraced this? Come on, tell them. Here I am. Here I am.
give myself to you. Well, can we say that as our prayer tonight? My life is not my own. Join me in our closing prayer. Wonderful God, we just thank you so much for joy down deep in our souls. We ask God that you would go with us this week. Let us live our denim blue jean faith out in the world. Teach us, Lord, to find our faith in you, to anchor our hope in you, and to believe, God, that you are big enough to hold every problem that we face in our lives this week. Let us always remember that you are there for us. We ask God that you would bless each one here today and bless our pastor, heal him. Let him feel your comfort around him this week as he continues to recover. We ask God that you would just bless us. Let us be the people that you want us to be in the world today. These things we ask in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen.